on to the cabinet with its link and through one line, it's looking at the loop, so close the loop. Okay. Um, hello, if you can hear me, uh, I'm sorry for the problems we've been having. The microphone stopped working, but uh, we've managed to get it working again now. Um, after the microphone stopped working, the camera also stopped working. So hope you've stayed with us and uh, we're just about ready to um, to restart the service. Um, I guess you saw the, the verse on the screen that I was reading out and talking about and then uh, we've been, I trust, singing together or listening to that wonderful song, Lifting High the Name of Jesus. No other name on earth can save, can raise a soul to life. And there's a a very important verse in the reading that we are going to hear this morning, which is, I just have to. let's turn our volume up. Right, we have done already. Very good. Um, so uh, there's an important verse in the reading we're going to have, which is Matthew 16, um, verse 34. And uh, I'd like to get this up on the screen if we can. Here we go. Right, and this is such an important verse that when Matthew uh, told us what Jesus had said, not only he, but Mark and Luke also told us exactly the same thing. So Matthew 16 verse 24, which we're going to look at in a minute, is the same as Mark 8 verse 34 and Luke 9 verse 23. You might like to look those up later and you'll see Matthew 16 24 says this, Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And when Mark uh, tells us about the same thing, it's almost exactly the same. Mark says, Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And Luke puts it like this. Jesus said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So Luke tells us Jesus said daily, which the others didn't mention. Um, if you've been following this in your own Bible, depending on what version you've got, you might have got slightly different wording. Um, this is from the new NIV version. The old version, which is the one we have in church, and what so my old Bible here has, says, Jesus said to them all, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So that expression, come after me, has been explained in the newer one as be my disciple because the disciples are the people who followed Jesus and came after him is if you want to be Jesus's friend if you want to stick with him this is what you've got to do deny yourself to deny means to say no and so Jesus wants us to say no to ourselves and yes to him take up our cross daily the cross of course was how the Lord Jesus died. It means giving up your life to him and follow me. Go his way. His way included giving up his life on the cross. His way involves telling the truth and loving people and he wants us to be like him as we follow him. Now there's a song to help us remember this verse because it's a great verse to have as a memory verse and uh, guess who the song is by it's uh, set to music by Colin here he is and before we start Colin playing I'll just explain this video is uh, one that he's made within lockdown to teach actions for this memory verse song so join in the actions if you like nobody will um, see if you don't And Jesus said to If anyone would come, come after me If anyone would come, come after me 
he must deny himself and take his cross up daily and follow, 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 follow me. That's Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Let's do it. If anyone would come, come after me. If anyone would come, come after me. He must deny himself and take his cross up daily and follow, 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 follow me. That's Luke chapter 9, verse 23. All right, running. Go running. Back the other way. Whoops, back there again. If anyone would come, come after me. If anyone would come, come after me. Aha, he must deny himself and take his cross up daily. And follow, 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 follow me. Wrong one. And follow, 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 follow me. That's Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Run, run, run. Follow, follow, follow. Did you join in the actions? I, I hope you had fun with that. Um, thanks, Colin, for providing that song and the actions and helping us all to remember what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, to be a Christian. Um, we Do you do well at following Jesus? We all of us fail sometimes, every day, to love Jesus as he wants. And so uh, we don't always deny ourselves. Sometimes we say no to Jesus and yes to ourselves. And so now's an invitation to us to come back to him and say sorry and say no to ourselves and yes to him. So let's return to the Lord our God and say to him, Father, we have sinned against heaven and against you. We are not worthy to be called your children. We turn to you again. Have mercy on us. Bring us back to yourself as those who once were dead, but now have life through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the promise. Because Jesus suffered and died for us, that we can be forgiven and that whatever we've done, you'll take it away and let us be your friends. So please help us to trust and follow Jesus. Amen. Now, Junior Church has um, already happened as usual during uh, our live stream system. We've got it on Zoom at 10 o'clock. Um, if you missed that and you're um, young enough to uh, want to come to Junior Church, please do get in touch and we'll uh, join you in on Zoom next week. And um, now we're going to look at a psalm. This one doesn't come up on the screen. Um, I'm going to read it from my Bible. So if you've got your Bible, you might like to turn to Psalm 16 in the middle of the, of the Bible um, or just listen. But this one is called um, a miktam of David. I don't know what a miktam is. Um, it's probably uh, what kind of song it was. Uh, but it's a song of David, the king of Israel. And David uh, is a figure in the Old Testament for the Messiah. God had promised another king like David. David had won battles and rescued God's people. And God promised there'd be somebody who would win an even bigger battle and rescue God's people in an even bigger way, the Messiah. And so when David writes this, those looking back on it can see pointers to what's going to happen with God's promised king. And Peter picked up on this when he was preaching to people after Jesus' resurrection, um, particularly the, the end bit of the psalm. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. 
I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You've made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You've made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And now we have, um, so keep hold of your, your Bible. We've got two readings from the scriptures now, which Phil Edge is bringing to us. Um, First, the, the Old Testament reading. Joshua is, I think, the sixth book in the Bible. And then uh, New Testament reading from Matthew, which we'll be focusing on more with the sermon. The first reading today is taken from Joshua, chapter 24, verses 14 to 18. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we travelled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites, who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. The second reading today is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. For, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death, before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. This is the word of the Lord. Jesus, our Saviour, did all those things that he said he was going to. And so as he calls us to follow him, 
all of our days we want to praise the wonders of his mighty love. Let's sing to my Jesus, my Saviour. <laughs> Jesus said to Peter, you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Heavenly Father, we find that the things of men or merely human concerns can so easily take over our thinking and dominate things for us. And we lose sight of your concerns and priorities, the things of God and we need your help and so we pray that you would open our eyes and lift our minds and our hearts to receive from you this morning help us to understand your word to us and take it to heart in a life-changing way amen a key question was answered last week um i was watching on the uh YouTube and uh, heard Wallace Ben's sermon and we heard the answer from Peter in Matthew 16 16 when he said to Jesus you are the Christ the son of the living God Peter then showed us a first step to becoming a Christian recognizing who Jesus is it's not enough to admire Jesus 
as a good teacher and moral example, Peter realised that Jesus is Christ, Messiah, the promised king that God sent to rescue his people, and that he's more than human, the son of God. If we're not sure about who Jesus is, it's a very important question to get to grips with. Peter has had a breakthrough and Jesus recognises it as momentous. It's a turning point for Jesus in his teaching of the disciples. Look at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Now, it would be a good thing as we look at this passage to do some cost-benefit analysis. First, let's look at the cost of Jesus' mission, because Jesus is on a mission, a rescue mission. That's how he fulfills his role as Messiah. But this is how it's going to work. It's not an option for Jesus. He's already resolved to, in obedience to his Father God to save people, and this is the only way for him to do that. This is what it will cost him. He must suffer and die. Now that comes as a shock to Peter. Peter has just identified Jesus as a winner and Jesus says he must suffer and die at the hands of the religious folk. That for Peter just doesn't compute. I don't think he even hears the bit at the end of verse 21 about on the third day being raised to life yet let alone understand it at this stage. He just hears Jesus talking like a loser. No wonder he takes him aside in verse 22 and begins to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. I imagine it's along these lines. Come on, Jesus, are you having a bad day and feeling a bit discouraged? You're not going to lose, you're a winner. You're not going to suffer and die. You're the, you're the son of the living God. Don't talk like that. Peter understands rightly from the Old Testament that the promised Messiah is a winner, a deliverer. That's clear from places like Psalm 110. He doesn't understand the other strand of teaching in the Old Testament that we see in places like Isaiah 53, that the Messiah is also the suffering servant of the Lord. Here are some words from Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. You see, there can be no deliverance from God without the suffering of the cross. You just can't have the Christ without the cross. That's why Jesus is so strong in his rebuke of Peter. Do you find it shocking that he calls him Satan when Peter meant well and, and he made an innocent mistake? But Jesus knows just how serious this error, this temptation is. He's heard it before. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 8, when Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if he would give up this cross path, and simply bow. Crossless Christianity is an invention of Satan. Jesus smells the sulphur on Peter's words. The salvation of the world is at stake. Peter, who Jesus had given the nickname the Rock Man, whose words in last week's reading form the foundation of the church, in this next paragraph has become Peter the stumbling stone. Out of my way, Satan, says Jesus, 
thankfully Jesus stuck with Peter and kept on teaching him so that by the time Peter wrote his letter to Christians he could also teach about Jesus. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. That's 1 Peter 2 24 and Peter's echoing and quoting uh, Isaiah's words that I read to you a moment ago. Now when Jesus says get behind me some people say that he doesn't just mean get out of my way but he means Peter stop trying to lead you're supposed to be following fall in line behind me Peter don't you tell me what to do I'm teaching you and I think there may be something in that, especially as the Greek word Matthew uses is exactly the same in verse 23 for get behind me as it is in verse 24 where the old NIV has come after me and the Collins song has and uh, the newer version says be my disciple. Jesus takes this opportunity to teach not only what his mission is going to cost him but secondly what following him is going to cost his disciples. So here's another cost, the cost of following Jesus. If you and I are already following Jesus, it's worth stopping and thinking, what difference is that making? Do we understand what it means? And if you're perhaps convinced about who Jesus is and considering the momentous step of becoming a Christian, you should be aware what you're getting into. Jesus gives a prospectus to his disciples, to any future disciples. Here, the key verse to focus on is verse 24, which by now we probably know by heart. Whoever wants to come after me or be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. He's calling people to stick closely to him. That means denying self. Now, self-denial is not so much about doing without some luxury, the kind of thing we might give up at Lent, but rather it's about disowning or renouncing oneself. Peter so tragically denied Jesus just before the crucifixion. He disowned him. Jesus calls us if anyone would come after him, calls us to renounce ourselves, say no to self, give up on my own hope of being good enough for God and trust Jesus instead. Stop valuing my own life as the most important thing and put Jesus in my number one spot instead. Let him take charge of my life rather than being my own boss. It's not all about me anymore. It's all about Jesus. Are you like me if you see a group photo that includes you and lots of other people in it? Who's the first person you look for in that picture? For me, it's me. I'm guessing for you it's probably you. But in life, it's not all about me. It's not all about you. It's all about Jesus. Jesus puts the requirement for a follower rather shockingly in an expression that might be a bit dulled by familiarity for us. Take up your cross. That horrific instrument of violent death. Any of Jesus' hearers had seen people carrying crosses. They knew what it meant. If someone was literally carrying a cross, it didn't mean they were putting up with a bit of suffering it meant their life was over. They were about to die on it. So if we take up our cross, we follow the way of Jesus who gave up his life for us. And we give up our life for him. So my life belongs to Jesus now. It's not my own. He's bought me at the cost of his blood. And the way of the cross was not comfortable for Jesus. It involved pain. So I can't expect a pain-free life if I've chosen to follow Jesus. People hated him. If we follow him, 
we can expect people to hate us. In different times and in different places, that's expressed in different ways. In some parts of the world, many, many Christians literally die for following Jesus. That may be unlikely for us at this time in this country, but we shouldn't be surprised to take some flack. His call to follow him means to go the way he went. So why would anyone choose to follow him then? Well, I said we'd do some cost benefit analysis. Let's think about the benefit because it really is worth it. If we give our life to Jesus, we will find out what life is really all about. We find that life without Jesus wasn't really life at all. And we become aware of a future in which the benefits of following Jesus are out of this world. He repeatedly taught that there's a day of reckoning coming, a day when all injustice will be put right. So all the racial injustice that God has seen, that people may think they've got away with, that people may not even have been very conscious of, they'll find they haven't got away with it. And each of us will have to give account for everything we've done when Jesus returns as king and judge. Does verse 27 worry you? The end of the verse, then he will reward each person according to what he has done. What do you deserve? We deserve judgment for all the wrong that we've done. And there's only one way to be safe on that day, and that is to put our trust in Jesus, who has taken the punishment, the judgment, in the place of all who trust in him. So we hand over our life to him and then we find real life. Verse 25, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. If we try and grip our own life and say, I, I want what I deserve and I want my life that I've got with me in charge, doing my best, we find that it slips like sand through our fingers. But if we let go, trust Jesus, we find he gives us real life, a new dimension in life that shows the life we've previously known is but a shadow by comparison. The word for life here is the same as the word for soul in verse 26. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? We might sell our soul to the gods of material wealth. We might pour our life into something other than following Jesus. But we will find it was a bad deal. The real benefit was in following Jesus where we will get more of our heart's desire and the reward then is more of Jesus, to be with Jesus forever. Now the last verse in this passage, verse 28, has caused difficulty for some people. Some people have read verse 28 and thought that Jesus must have been mistaken about when he was going to come back, that he expected and promised his return would be within the lifetime of his original hearers. Some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. But I, if Jesus is who we've become convinced with Peter that he is, that can't be right. I think the natural way to understand verse 28 is that in this context, when Jesus says the Son of Man is coming in his kingdom, he means not his second coming. He means not his second coming, but the coming of his reign on earth, which people saw 
following his resurrection as the gospel message spread around the world and millions of people started to bow the knee to Jesus as king. And that is a great joy for all who choose now to follow him. Denying self and taking up our cross is hard, but it's the only way for us, just as it was the only way for Jesus whom we follow. And if we follow him on that road through shame, we follow him to glory and share in his resurrection. How could we not take up his invitation? As we reflect on that, um, we have a song now, oh, Praise the Name of Jesus. And so uh, this looks back to, I cast my mind to Calvary, the, another name for Golgotha, the, the hill where Jesus died on the cross. And thinking then about the resurrection of Jesus as well and his coming again, uh, what can we do but praise his name and follow him?
and let's um, join in saying the creed together which out outlines the, these great things that Jesus did for us suffering dying and rising again so we say together I believe I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ his only Son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended to the dead on the third day he rose again he ascended into heaven he is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come to judge the living and the dead I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting Amen Let's pray as Molly leads us. Let us pray. We begin our prayers with a verse from today's readings in Joshua. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Loving, faithful Father, we pray that with your gracious help we may learn to serve you with all faithfulness and that we may be able to say boldly, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We remember your suffering for us, Lord, and we pray for Christians all over the world who are persecuted for their faith. The Covid restrictions mean that globally many persecuted Christians no longer have income, can't buy food and are often ignored when official aid is distributed. We pray for Open Doors, the organisation that works to raise awareness and to mobilise prayer, support and action. We remember David and Heather, Mike and Vicky and ask that you will bless them with the good health and enthusiasm that they need to work for you day by day. We lift our Prime Minister and other world leaders to you and ask that you would grant them wisdom and that they would govern with fairness and a real desire to work in the best interests of your people. We pray for all our families. We think particularly of those who are suffering financial problems. We lift marriages and other family relationships to you, especially those made more difficult with the stresses of the present situation. We give thanks that John Clifford is bearing up well after the death of Vilma and we ask Lord that you will help John and his family to make wise decisions for the future. We pray for Mary Woodman, for Kathleen and all those in care homes that your peace and love will be felt by them. We thank you for the carers who have planned a special Italian afternoon for the residents at Bridgemead and for all their loving care. We ask for your merciful care for Gwyn Merrison, Anne Talbot and Janet Netherwood and any others who are known to us. We thank you Lord for your gift of children. We pray now for their safety as they return to school. We thank you for all the hard work undertaken by the teachers and all the school staff as they have prepared their schools for the weeks ahead. We pray that the return to school will be a joyous time for children and teachers and that it will bring a well-needed rest for parents who have juggled home tutoring with their own jobs for so long. We pray for our church in Bathampton. We give thanks for Anna, Ian and the team for their work. They've tried so hard to keep the live services going in Jonty's absence and have done so well. We pray for Anna as she takes a holiday and Jonty as he returns. May he be refreshed, Lord, filled with the energy he needs. And we praise and thank you that the children's work is continuing in such capable hands. 
We thank you, Father, for our city of Bath, for its beauty and its history. We ask your help for all those businesses that are experiencing financial hardships at this time. And now, dear Heavenly Father, we really want to praise you and thank you that you are our Father, our King, our Rock, our Redeemer and our very best friend. Amen. Amen. And we've prayed uh, with Molly for a number of individuals um, and th at this time quite a few people have have died recently and there's some other families to pray for too we thank you heavenly father for the life of hillary salmon thank you for all that she meant to us in our church family and in barthampton and we pray as well as for her extended family we pray for um olive webster and her son-in-law William following the death of Olive's daughter Nikki and we pray for the family of Jean Riley and we ask that you would bring your comfort and hope in the Lord Jesus for his name's sake Amen and now um, let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And before we sing our, our final hymn, just a couple of other things to say. Do text in again. We haven't been live for the last three weeks, um, so I haven't been doing this. But uh, live again this morning, as you noticed, with all that went wrong uh, in the first few minutes of the service. Thanks for bearing with us. And do take advantage of the fact that it's live and text in a greeting to the rest of the church. Or you might... Um, like to take up this challenge which uh, Anna raised in the email inviting us to send photos in just send in a text now saying in one sentence why you are a Christian we've been looking a bit um, from that conversation between Peter and Jesus as to, to what it means about uh, to be a Christian and whether it's worth it um, why not uh, chip in why you're a Christian in one sentence there's the prayer line, um, Phil and Molly. Uh, Molly's been leading us in prayer and now um, if you'd like a, an individual prayer with Phil or Molly, um, do send them a text or, or phone them up at the end of the service. Um, there's the dialer service number to pass on to anyone who can't get on the internet who might like to hear a recording. And um, a couple of other things as well as um, Zoom virtual coffee afterwards. Sorry, there's an out of date slide on there that says say farewell to Hugh. We did that a few weeks ago um, and uh, keeping in touch with him. But um, what is important on that slide is the Zoom meeting number. So for coffee after the service, if you can use Zoom and type in that number 86125312351, it's the same number to use on Thursday evening, where I hope we'll all. Uh, come along on Zoom to pray together. It'll be the first Thursday in the month, so um, 7.30, uh, praying for one another, for our, our church, our mission, our mission partners. Um, and um, please come if you can, Zoom on, on Thursday at 7.30. The other thing that I wanted to mention is this evening, um, which I, I mentioned earlier as well, at six o'clock we're having an actual um, communion service. There won't be wine, but there'll be wafers um, to help us remember the body and blood of Jesus given for us. And so if you'd like to come along um, to that, uh, for the time being we've been 
having our main gathering online still and we couldn't fit everyone in church together but for those who would particularly like to gather um, I'm looking forward to being with you at six o'clock in St Nicholas's this evening with social distancing and face coverings and um, in a slightly strange situation no congregational singing but uh, organ music and a communion service and um, in the next couple of weeks or so the PCC will be discussing and deciding uh, the way forward with our virtual and physical gatherings um, you might like to uh, think about your regular giving um, and so bank standing order is the most efficient and helpful way for that um, but it's also fine to give by text which is um, kind of equivalent to putting cash in the in the bag that would have been passed around during a hymn if we were not so um, restricted and as well as giving for St Nicholas Church uh, you could give for our mission focus same number 70470 um, this is the last Sunday where that giving will go to the Bread of Life Society through St Nicholas's and from next week onwards that will go for our mission partners in Uganda, David and Heather Sharland with CMS and we'll be hearing more about them over the next few weeks, the long term support uh, that we have been and are giving them. Oh Jesus, I've promised to serve you to the end. Uh, following Jesus is not comfortable, uh, but he helps us. And so this is a prayer. Give me grace to follow my master and my friend. Oh,
haven't, we haven't had any um, texts this morning for me to read out. Um, and uh, I guess we lost some people when um, things froze at the beginning, but others might catch up later on the uh, uh, recording on YouTube. Um, hope to see some of you at Virtual Coffee in just a minute. And so, so let's pray for God's blessing together. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. May the joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. May the power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.